Hello, good afternoon. Happy Wednesday, y'all. Woden's Day. So welcome. I am going to attempt to read the end of Seership, Guide to Soul Sight and the Magic Mirror and How to Use It. And we're getting into this last portion, which is entitled Magical Arts, Making Magical Mirrors. So glasses, I, I was really struggling to find my water, but I like going live at the 111. And welcome everyone who said hello already. Genevieve, Tanya, Alex, Cool Gamer, welcome everybody. Um, glaciers. They look pretty good. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. <clears throat> this third part of the present book is added to answer the numerous correspondents who, for many years past, have pressed me for something on the points involved in the book proper, and to give, in a concise and condensed form, information which it would be wholly impossible to write out for even a small part of the number who ask for it. I first quote the subjoined article. Quote, The Far East must never lead the world in the practice of necromancy, all the skill and mechanical ingenuity of the most expert prestidigi prestidigitours of Europe or America cannot produce a single exhibition which will compare with the facts of the commonest Indian juggler. <laughs> the Japanese have taught us the greater part of the sleight of hand illusion, which is now parted before staring audiences which is now parted before staring audiences in this country and in Europe. But the necromancy of Japan is a boy's play compared with the mysterious jugglery of the neither and farther Indies. Oh, nether, nether and farther Indies, and especially of Siam. In the latter country, there is a royal troop of jugglers who perform only at the funerals and coronations of the kings, and then only in the presence of the nobles of Siam, or those initiated into the mysteries of the religion of the country. These necromancers do not perform for money, are of noble blood, and it is seldom that a European sees even their faces. Last year, however, an English surgeon who was in the country performed a somewhat remarkable cure upon a princess who had been treated in vain by all the physicians of the country. Great was the gratitude of the Siamese court at the doctor's performance, and as a reward, commensurate, commensurate with his great service, he was permitted to witness the performance of Tepada's royal troop of jugglers. This exhibition was given in the sacred temple of Juthia on the 16th of November. The occasion began the coronation of the young king. The surgeon's narrative, stripped of a large amount of description and materially condensed, is given below. In the temple of Juthia. Ooh, oh my gosh. Kodaka Beats, welcome. Awesome. Welcome, y'alls. This is so juicy. In the temple of Juthia, if that's how you pronounce that. Woon Tajak called me very early, and he and his father's cousin, a jolly, fat old gentleman called Sundach Tom Bondar, set to work to prepare me for witnessing the performances in the Great Pagoda. A white turban was wound around my head. My skin was stained the color of new bronze. My mustache ruthlessly trimmed down, blacked, and waxed till it had the proper Malian M-A-L-A-Y-N, Malayan, Malayan, dejected droop and tenuity. Okay, well, let's look up Ma Malayan. Is it, is it a place? Oh, oops, it's already. Malayan. It's an animal. It's an animal. Or it's another term for Malay, Malayan definition. 
Malayan. Malayan. Malayan, another term for Malay, which means a member of a people inhabiting Malaysian and Indonesia. Oh, Malaysia and inhabiting Malaysia and Indonesia. <laughs> I'm such a dork. Malayan, my bad. And wax till it had the proper Malayan dejected droop and tenuity. My eyebrows blacked and native garments furnished me over which I wore the long white robes, which I was told were peculiar to the initiated. The pagoda of Juthia is more celebrated for its sacredness than its size or the splendor of its architecture. It is nevertheless a building of some very striking features. It is situated without the city upon a broad and commanding terrace elevated considerably above the level of the river plains. It is approached from the city by a long brick paved avenue, wide, straight, and imposing. Admit one. Sundach and Wuntajak, each holding me by an arm, now directed me toward one of the doorways of the temple. It was guarded by two men with drawn swords and very fierce aspect, who stood in front of a heavy drapery of red cloth that concealed the interior of the temple from outside eyes. At the triple password, these men admitted my companions, but crossed their swords before my breast. Sundach whispered in the ear of the elder of the two. He started, uh, he started, gazed at me intently, but did not withdraw his barrier. Woon showed him a signet. He took it and reverently placed it upon his forehead, yet still he refused to admit me. There was a controversy between the doorkeeper and my companions, and at last the elder guardian whistled shrilly upon a bone pipe tied about his neck with a strand of silk. A tall man suddenly appeared. I could not see from whence. He was middle-aged, athletic, and had a most peculiar, cunning, self-possessed self look of person and intelligence. <clears throat> this is so exciting. Yeah, this, this is juicy. Tapada. Okay, it just says Tapada. And then exclaimed, it looks like this. Tapada. Exclaimed both of my companions at once. But the man who was naked, except for a breech cloth, took no notice of them. He put his hand heavily, but not unkindly, upon my breast, gave me a piercing, long look and said in excellent French, are you a brave man? Try me, I said. Instantly, without another word, he bandaged my eyes with a part of the long white robe I wore. He snapped his finger suddenly, whispering in my ears, not a word for your life. And the next moment I found myself seized in the hands of several strong men and borne some distance along a devious way, ascending and descending several times. At last I was put down, the bandage was quietly removed, and I found myself squatted on a stone floor between Sundach and Wuntajak, who, with bowed heads and faces partly shrouded in their white robes, squatted like statues of Buddha, their knees and shins close to the ground, their haunches resting upon their knees, their hands spread palms downward upon their knees, their eyes deflected, and a look of devout reverence and abstracted meditation in their countenances. The light was dim to my unaccustomed eyes, but all around, as far as I could see, were white-robed worshippers crouched in the same attitude of silent reverence. A weird scene. Quote, by degrees, as my eyes drew used to the dim glo gloom, I began to look about me. The place was a square vault, so lofty that I could not see the ceiling, and I should say not less than a hundred paces long and wide. All around the sides rose gigantic columns, carved into images of Buddha always, yet with a thousand variations from the central plan, a thousand freaks of fancy, a thousand grotesqueries, through which shone the more effectively for the departures, the eternal calm, the stagnant, unperturbed ecstasy of apathy of Buddha's, Buddha's remarkable face, with the great pendant ears, and the eyes looking out beyond you into the supreme whistle, uh, whistlessness of Niobin, Niobin, whistlessness of Niobin, 
a face that once seen can never be forgotten. Wow. Neobin, let's look it up. Neoban. No, not Nubian. Neoban. No, Neobian? No, N I O B A N. Let's try this one. N I O B I A N. Lexico. Of a mineral having a small proportion of a constituent element replaced by nobium. Hmm. It just could be a name, too. The supreme wistlessness of Nobian, a face that once seen can never be forgotten. Neobin, Neobin. By de oh, let me get back into here. By degrees, I came to see the plan of this evidently subterranean vault and to look with wonder upon the simple grandeur of its massive architecture, which was severely plain, except so far as the carving of the great columns, was a raised dais or platform covered with red cloth. This stage was raised between three and four feet above the floor of the vault, and was about thirty-five or forty feet deep and one hundred and fifty broad. Behind it, a curtain of red cloth hung down from the capitals of the towering columns, in front of the stage, just about the spot where the pulpit of the orchestra in a Greek theater would be, was the tripod-shaped altar with a broad censer upon it, in which was burning a scented oil mixed with gums and aromatic wood that diffused through the whole vault a pungent sacramental odor. The Opening Ceremonies Suddenly, there was a wild and startling crash of barbaric music from under the stage, gongs, drums, cymbals, and horns. And with wonderful alertness and a really indescribable effect, a band of naked men came out from behind the curtains, bearing each a scented torch in his hand, climbed the columns with the agility of monkeys, and lighted each a, each a hundred lamps, strung from the base almost of the columns, sheer up to the apex of the vault, which I could now see rose in a lofty dome that doubtless peered far up into the interior of the pagoda proper. Damn, this really paints a picture, doesn't it? It's awesome. The illumination from these multitudinous lamps was very brilliant, too soft to be dazzling or overpowering, yet so penetrating and pervasive that one missed nothing of the perfect light of the day. The din of the horrible orchestra increased, and a band of old women came out from under the stage singing, or rather shrieking out, the most diabolical chant that I ever heard. The red curtain fluttered a little. There was a dull thud, and there, right before us, alongside the censer, took a very old man, stood a very old man, but wrinkled with long hair and beard, white as cotton fleece. His fingernails were several inches long, and his sunken jaws were horribly diversified with two long teeth, yellow and ogreish. O g r e i s h, yellow and ogreish. He was naked except for the breechcloth, and his shrunken muscles shone with oil. He took the censer in his hand and blew with his breath into it, until the flame rose twenty feet high, red and furious. Then, with a sudden jerking motion, he tossed the burning oil toward the crowd of squatting spectators. It shot upward, then a broad sheet of terrible flame. It shot upward them, a broad sheet of terrible flame. It descended upon them, a shower of roses and Jap japonicas. Is that another type of flower? More than could have been gathered in a cart. Turning the censer bottom upward, he spun it for a minute upon the point of his long thumbnail, then flung it disdainfully away toward the audience. It struck the pavement with a metallic clang, bounced, and rose with sudden expanse of wings. Wow! <laughs> I feel like 
I can see this. And I, I just, I mean, I can, I, <clears throat> lots of thoughts. Oh, let's look up that word. Um, Japonicas, J-A-P-O-N-I-C-A-S. It's like harmonica. <laughs> Alex, welcome back. Awesome. -o. Where are you at? Here we are. Japonica. Japonica. Another term for common camellia. Another term for flowering quince. Quince that grew out at the farm. Oh, different kind of. Wow, it's beautiful. Let me show, let me share. Let's see. Um, no, no, no. The picture, the picture. Open image in new tab. Oh, it's a baby in here. Okay, let's... You know what? I can just share this whole screen real quick. You just got to see this flower. It's beautiful. Um, share. Screen. Window. Um... Chrome tab, Japonica, Google search, share. Look at that. No, why do you keep doing that to me? Um, let's try this. Look at that. Look at the way the leaves are formed. How do I make this bigger? It's okay. We get the idea. Ooh, look at that thing. Ooh, look at that one. Man, geometry, seeds. Huh? Dude, the design. Camellia. Japonica. That's cool. I'm glad we did that. Okay. Hey, Karen, welcome in. Awesome. <laughs> A shrieking eagle. Hmm. Frightened horribly and seeking flight toward the summit of the dome. The old man gazed a moment upward, then seeing the tripod upon which the censer had stood, he sent its legs apart. With a nervous hand, straightened them against his knee and hurled them dart-like toward the eagle. My throat just made a weird noise. <laughs> they glanced upward with a glided flash, and instantly the eagle came fluttering down to the pavement in our midst, dead, and three horrible cobras coiled about him, and lifting their hooded heads defiantly, and flashed anger out of their glittering eyes. The music shrieked still wilder. The snakes coiled and plated themselves together in a rhythmic dance. Wow! lifting the dead eagle upon their heads, and presto, tight in our midst, three stood the tripod, oh, there stood the tripod again, with its flickering flame and its incense-savored breath. A more perfect illusion never was seen. That's the new, that's the nor, norodom, norodom, N-O-R-O-D-O-M, norodom, that's the Nerodum whispered wound to Jack in my ear. Another actor now came upon the scene, whom I recognized to be the tall athletic Te Tepada. Behind him came a smaller man whose name, wound to Jack informed me, was Minmon, M-I-N-H-M-A-N, Minmon, and a boy, probably 12 years old, called Sinki, Tsinki. These four began some of the most wonderful athletic exhibitions that can be. <coughs> <coughs> well, I didn't get there in time to pause it. Let me try. Excuse me. 
Little Wing, awesome. Oh, welcome in. This is so fascinating. Oh my gosh. These four began some of the most wonderful athletic exhibitions that can be conceived. Balls, there's this tickle. It's 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 rising up. One sec. I'm not sure. We'll see what shakes. It seems like every time I start narrating, it's like I can feel it traveling right here. <laughs> so, a shrieking eagle. Wait, I read that. It is impossible to believe, unless you saw it, what work these men put human muscles to. I am not going to provoke the incredulity, incredulity of your readers by attempting to describe the majority of them. In one feat, Tapata seized Norodom by his long white beard, held him off at arm's length, and spun around with him until the old man's legs were horizontal to the athlete's shoulders. Wow. <laughs> then, while they still spawn, S-P-O-N, while they still spawn with the fury of dervishes, Minmin sprang up, seized upon Nerodum's feet, and spun out a horizontal continuation of the ancient. And when Minmin was firmly established, the boy Tsinki caught to his feet in lie manner, and the tall athlete, every muscle in him straining, continued to whirl the human jointless lever around. At last, Slowing slightly, Tapata drew in his arms till the old man's white beard touched his body. There was a sudden strain, and the arms of the man of the men from being horizontal became perpendicular. Nerodum's head rested atop of Tapata's, Niman's head upon Nerodum's feet, and Tsinki's head on Niman's feet. A pause for breath. Then the column of men was propelled into the air, and presto, Tapata's head was on the ground. Narodum's feet to his to his Minma's feet upon Narodum's head, Tasinki's feet on Minmin's head. Each had turned a somersault, and the column was unbroken. Wow. Man. Metamorphosis. One trick which Minmin performed was a very superior version of the mango tree feat of the Indian jugglers. He took an orange, cut it open, and produced a serpent. This he took down into the audience, and borrowing a robe from one, cut the snake's head off and covered it with the robe. Then the robe was lifted again. A fox was in the place of the snake. The fox's head was cut off, two robes borrowed, and when they were raised, there was a wolf which was killed with a sword. Three robes and a leper appeared. It was slain with a javelin. Four robes covered the most savage looking buffalo. That was killed with an ax. Five robes covered in part, but not altogether, a lordly elephant who then the sword was pointed against him, seized Minmin by the neck and tossed him violently up. He mounted feet foremost and finally clung by his toes to the capital of one of the columns. Tapata now leaped from the stage and aligned upon the elephant's shoulders. With a short sword, he goaded the beast on the head until shrieking, the unwieldy, the un, the unwieldy animal reared upon its hind feet, twined its trunk about one of the great columns, and seemed trying to lift itself from the ground and wrap its body around the great pillar. The music clashed out barbarously, Bar 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 barbarously, clashed out barbarously. Narodum flashed forth a dazzling firework of some sort, and the elephant had disappeared. And Tapata lay upon the stage, writhing in the fold of a great boa constrictor, and holding up Minmin upon his feet. Wow! 
Desert Rose, welcome in. Awesome. The beautiful Luan Prabana. A perfectly formed and most lovely notch girl sprang out upon the stage and was hailed with universal exclamations of delight, everybody calling out her name, Luan Prabana, as if it were a word of good omen. Her only dress was a short petticoat of variegated featherwork. A wreath of rosebuds crowned her soft, short black hair, and she wore a pearl necklace, as well as broad gold armlets and anklets. With a brilliant smile, she danced exquisitely for some minutes to the accompaniment of a single pipe. Then she knelt and laid her, he her head on old Norodom's, Norodom's knee. The boy f fanned her with a fan made of sweet fern leaves. Minmin fetched a lotus-shaped golden goblet, and Tapata poured into it from a quaint-looking flask of fluid of greenish hue. The old yogi-like Narodam took the goblet and blew his breath upon the contents till they broke into a pale blue flame. This Tapata, this Tapata ex ex <clears throat> extinguished with his breath. Then Narodam held the goblet to Luan Prabhana's lips, and she drained the contents with a sigh. As if transfigured, she suddenly sprang to her feet, her face strangely radiant, and began to spin giddily around in one spot. First the boy, then Minmun, then Tapata, tried to arrest her, but they no sooner touched her than that thrilled them as if she had imparted an electric spark to them. Spinning constantly, with a bewildering, rapid motion, the girl now sprang off the stage and down the hall, along by the foot of the columns. Tsinki, Minmin, and Tapata in active pursuit. In and out among the crowd they spun. The three chasing, Tapata seized hold of the chaplet that crowned her. It broke, and as she was whirling along, a spray of rosebuds was scattered from her brow in every direction. Anything more graceful never was seen. And now a greater wonder. At the extremity of the hall, the three surrounded and would have seized her when, still revolving, she rose slowly into the air and floated gently over our heads toward the stage, scattering roses as she went. At the brink of the stage, she paused in mid-air, with a, then with a slight wing-like motion of her arms, mounted up, up toward the loftiest arch of the vault overhead, suddenly Old Narodam seized bow and arrow and shot toward her. There was a wild shriek, a rushing sound, and the dancer fell with a crash to the flags of the floor and laid there an apparent bloody mass. The music burst forth into a wild wail, and the chorus of old hags came tumultuously forth and bore her off in their arms. Was it a miracle? Now, from behind the red curtains, that was, a, that was actually a question. <clears throat> now, from behind the red curtains came a dozen strong men bearing on their shoulders a great leaden box, which they laid upon the front part of the stage. As they retired, the old women came out. As they retired, the old women came out bringing a low, a low couch decorated with flowers and gold embroidered dra drapery upon which lay Luan Prabana decked forth in bridal garments and sweetly sleeping. The couch with its sleeper was put quietly down upon the front of the stage and left there, while Narodam and Tamata, maybe Tapata, I think it's supposed to be Tapata, went to the leaden box and with hot irons attempted to unseal it. That is Stung, Stung Tang's coffin, whispered Wound to me. The old saint has been dead more than half a millennia. Quickly, eagerly, it seemed to me, the two men broke open the fastenings of the coffin until the side next to the audience falling out at last, the teak box was discovered. This was pried open with a small crowbar and what seemed a great bundle of nankeen taken out. What's nankeen? 
and what seemed a great bundle bundle of nankeen taken out. Let's look up nankeen. Nankeen. N a n k e e n. Nankeen. 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 A yellowish cotton cloth. Cool. The characteristics. Yellowish buff. Color of nan nankeen. Cool. Nankeen. A yellowish cotton cloth. Oh, wow. Awesome. Awesome. You guys rock. <clears throat> nankeen. And a great bundle of nankeen taken out. Tapata and Narodam commenced to unwind this wrapping, which was very tight. Yard after yard was unwound and folded away by Minmin, -min. and at last after at least 100 yards of wrapping had been taken off, the dry, shriveled mummy of a small old man was visible, eyes closed, flesh dry, and hard dead and dry as a smoked herring. Narodam tapped the corpse with the crowbar, and it gave a dull, wooden sound. Tapata tossed it up and caught it. It was still as a log. Then he placed the mummy upon Narodam's knees and fetched a flask of oil, a flask of wine, and a censer burning with some pungent incense. Narodam took from his hair a little box of inugent, <clears throat> un, un, unguent, a little box of unguent, and prying open the mouth of the mummy with a cold chisel, showed that the dry tongue could rattle like a chip against the dry fosses. F a u c e s. Unguent. A little box of unguent. Let's look it up. Unguent. Unguent. What? Unguent. 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 A soft, greasy, or vicious substance used as ointment. Viscous, not vicious, viscous. A soft, greasy, or viscous substance used as ointment or for lubrication. Unguent. Unguent. Cool, I like that weird word. Unguent. Um... A little box of unguent. Narodam, okay, so Narodam took from his hair a little box of unguent and prying open the mouth of the mummy with a cold chisel showed that the dry tongue could rattle like a chip against the dry fosses. So F A U C E S. And, uh, the arched opening at the back of the mouth leading to the pharynx. Foces. Foces. Pharynx. Okay. Foces. Foces. The arched opening at the back of the mouth leading to the pharynx. Foces. Ah. <clears throat> oh, yeah, this guy's a physician. with his hair lubricant. Wow. Un, un, oh. Unguent. Unguent. Foces. Against the dry foces. He filled the mouth with unguent and closed it and anointed the eyelids, nostrils, and ears. Then he and Tapata mixed the wine and oil and carefully rubbed every part of the body with it. Then laying down in a reclining position, they put the burning censer upon the chest and withdrew a spice or withdrew a space while the drums and gongs and cymbals clashed and clattered and the shrill crackling treble of the chorus of old women rose hideously. A la Lazarus. 
A breathless pause ensued, one, two, three minutes, and the mummy sneezed, sneezed thrice, so violently as to extinguish the flame of the censer. A moment later, the thing sat up and stared, blinked, and vacant, oh, blinking and vac blinking and vacant. Out around the vault, an old wrinkled man with mumbling chops, a shriveled breast and belly, and little tufts of white hair upon his chin and forehead. Tapata approached him reverently upon his knees, bringing a salver with wine and a wafer cake. The old man did not notice him, but ate, drank, and tottered to his feet, the feeblest, decrepit old dotard that ever walked. In another moment, he saw the notch girl slumbering upon her, upon her couch. He scuffled feebly to her, and mumbling, stooped as if to help his dim eyes to see her better. With a glad cry, the maiden waked, collapsed him in her arms, and to her breast, and kissed him. Incomprehensible magic! Exclamation point. He was no longer a non non a a non nega Hagenarian, a non-Neganarian. Uh, he was no longer a non-Neganarian dotard. Okay. N-O-N. -N. I don't know what that, I don't know. Here. Foces? Foces. Foces. Non, 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 <laughs> Ah, I don't see it. Nonaganarian. Nonaganarian, maybe. Nonaganarian. Nonagenarian. Nonagenarian. A person who is from 90 to 99 years old. <laughs> Nonagenarian. Dude, we're learning some sweet words today. Nonagenarian. 90 to 99 years old, a nonagenarian. He was no longer a nonagenarian, dotard, but a full-veined, fiery youth who gave her kiss for kiss. How the transformation was wrought, I have no idea, but there it was before our eyes. The music grew soft and passionate. The chorus of the old women came out, and with strange phallic songs and dances bore the two away, a bridal pair. I never expect again to behold a sight so wonderful as that whole transformation, which I may mention, my learned Jesuit friend, to whom I described it, regards as a piece of pure symbolism. His explanation is too long and too learned to quote, but he connects the ceremony with the old world myth of Venus and Adonis and claims that it is all a form of sun worship. Wow. Back to the tomb. The show went on for some time longer, with many curious feats. At the end of an hour, the phallic procession returned, but this time, the Bayadir led it. The Bayadir, B-A-Y-A-D-E-R-E. A strange triumph in her eyes, while the youth lay upon the couch sleeping. The phallic chorus sank into a dirge. The youth faded visibly. He was again the shriveled dotard. He sighed, then breathed no more. Luan Prabana retired sorrowfully. Narodam and Tapata wrapped the corpse again in its interminable shrouds, restored it to the coffin, and it was borne away again. The attendants climbed up to the extinguished, climbed up and extinguished the lights. I was blindfolded and borne away again. I found myself once more at the doorway of the temple in the broad sunshine with my friends. As the mystic ceremonies of the great temple of Juthia were over, it may be for many years. Wow. What a thing to behold. Oh, that word. Bayadir. Let's, let's look. A 
female Hindu dancer, especially one at a southern Indian temple? Bayadair. 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 Cool. Bayadair. The show went on for some time longer with many curious feats. At the end of an hour, the phallic procession returned. But this time, the Bayadair led it. A strange triumph in her eyes. While the youth lay upon the couch sleeping, the phallic chorus sank into a dirge. The youth faded visibly. He was again the shriveled dotard. He sighed, then breathed no more. Damn, dude. <clears throat> With... My screen just went blank. The phallus chorus sunk into a dirge. Can anything be plainer or more direct in confirmatory proof of what I had written in this book than this excerpt from a newspaper dated April 11th, 1974, months after this book was completed, but the appearance of which necessitated a brief additional page or two? There is not need to go to far off Siam to witness such marvels or to learn their strange principa, for I have not only witnessed displays of high magic in this country, quite as marvelous, but different from the above, but have myself performed the feat of fire drawing and come very near destroying the life of a woman who assisted at the right. And but for the quick, brave, self-sacrificing action of Dr. Charles Maine of Boston, that woman would have been slain by fire, drawn down from the ethereal spaces by principles known to me. For 15 years, I sought a female of the right organization, a, Europe, an, a European or American Luan Probana, the fair and virgin invocatrice. And not till March 1874 did I find her, but her self-will and brother-in-law's, he was a pupil, lack of decision determined me to seek elsewhere for the true material, which, it is needless to say, I have found again in my own personal circle. The mysteries are all wrought through the phallic, discal, yoni principles in unsullied purity and the highest, noblest worship known to man. The great trouble with all whom I have partly taught in this land is that they, not one of them, saw anything nobler than the brilliant chance of sure gain, the opportunities to gratify passion. Wherefore, the co of course, I dropped them all. The phenomenal magic recounted in the extract given above, together with the equally startling things of Egypt, Negroland, Japan, China, Tartary, and India, only distantly approached by the fire tests, materialization, and the like, has seen in the case of Hume, the Baltimore Negro and others, together with the air floating of various persons, myself included, are so far as real use is concerned. But secondly, trifles compared to that loftier system of that far orient, whereby persons are enabled to glimpse behind the scenes of life. And note that transpires, and note what transpires on the further side. To the, to the special consideration of that transcendent, fa or transcendent phase of high magic, I shall devote this concluding chapter of my book, observing, ere I do so, that I hope these things now written will neither be scattered to the winds or seized on, seized on in the interests of either dollars of lust, for I cannot help utterly despising the worshippers of either Mammon or Priapus. One thing, however, is absolutely certain, and this is it. No one can succeed in either, in either branch of high magic whose spur and motive is such as I depreciate above, but success is sure to eventually crown the efforts of the persevering student whose aims are goodness and the acquisition of power for noble ends. For many ages, <clears throat> people have sought to penetrate through or lift the veil which hangs between the world we inhabit and that vast realm where causes reside and principles exist. To that end, recourse has been had to drugs such as opium, cannabin, and camphora, to mesmerism, 
psychology, discs, magnets, and fasting, and in later times to circles and various so-called marvelous methods, all of which in the end have proved, proved unsatisfactory, and the student and searcher has been by them left worse off than before. Not all persons can reach the interior site by such methods, because all are not possessed of the essential organic attributes or constitutional bias and tendency. To all such there is a surer, better, safer, and grander road, and that is self-development, by means entirely within the reach of everyone, and which are within their will and control. These require but the elements of time, patience, uh, persistence, assiduity, ass assiduity, let's look it up, and periodical efforts to ensure, if not complete success in soul sight, then in those other qualities, powers, and attributes essential to perfect human character. Assiduity? Assiduity. Let's find out. <clears throat> A-S-S-I-D-U-I-T-Y. Assiduity. 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 <laughs> Assiduity. 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 <laughs> it's archaic. <laughs> Constant attentions to someone. Assiduity. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we have to find that word again. Assiduity. Time, patience, assiduity, persistence, and periodical effort to ensure, if not complete success in soul sight, then in those other qualities, powers, and attributes essential to perfect human character. That agency, I hold, is some form of the spirit glass or lens, not the Urim and Thummim, a Thummim, Thummim, Urim and Thummim, or metallic breastplates used for purposes of divination. Urim, Urim, and Thummim, and worn by the priesthood, as recounted in the Bible, nor the stones and crystals of latter days, but the perfected spirit seeing or magic glass formed of minerals prepared in the Orient and fitted for use in Paris, France. These are of two genetic kinds. Oh, no, no. These are of two generic kinds and also of diverse grades, sizes, sensitiveness, focal, focal power, and magnetic planes because those made for and adopted to one line of use are not so well suited to different lines. <clears throat> First, the common king averages about eight inches. It doesn't say king balls. <laughs> First, the common kind averages about eight inches by seven and is a true athic mirror. A and E are both capitalized in that word for some reason. An athic mirror adopted to ordinary ends, such as invoking the dead and the other purposes for which they have for ages been used. The difference between the spirit-seeing mirrors, such as already described, and the methods and materials of their construction set forth, and those here and after described, is the difference between a first-class gold repeater and a common cylinder escapement watch. Both are timekeepers, but one is vastly superior to the other. The materials of the two classes of mirrors are quite dissimilar, <clears throat> and the labor expended on those here and after described is simply enormous for after they come into the hands of us in America, they cost an immensity of toil in cleaning, polishing, heating, bathing, and magnetic manipulation. And this it is that renders them valuable and adopted to the uses for which from hoary antiquity they were intended. I have seen a very small crystalline mirror weighing less than a pound, for which the owner demanded 4,000 in gold coin, and was not at all anxious to part with it even at that price. Second, 
the latter and finer ones of the same sort, but which of course are far better, stronger, more perfectly magnetic, and have a great deal wider range. Formerly, there were five sizes of this class, but it was found that but two could be depended on, as the as the rest were extremely liable to fracture by reason of the great climate climate ranges of temperature in Western Europe and North America. This class were also found better suited to beginners than to proficient seers, especially those who not content with the limited ranges of the ordinary ones were anxious for a perfected instrument of greater sensitiveness, magnetic caliber, focal range, aesthetic aesthetic basin, or magnet reservoir, and of a capacity equal to the solution of almost any subject capable of demonstration by such means. Wherefore, that that form was superseded in 1874 by the ne plus ultra of all such things in that line. Fine oval magnetic polar ones with deeper, broader, larger basins or magnetic reservoirs presenting a deep sea surface, nearly absolutely perfect, and leaving almost nothing to wish for in any respect, a beautiful, clear ovoid, and of size, focal length, and caliber seldom equaled and never surpassed. They go in grades, sizes, ranges, and cost according to their luminant power. In January 1874, I received a few of these from Paris, <clears throat> and hung them on my chamber wall to charge and fit them for their owner. A lady, and there they remained till the morning of February 8, when they became suddenly illuminant, and no grander sight ever was beheld by human eyes that was presented on that memorable morning. For the whole starry galaxies, rolling world systems of nebulae, vast conjuries, vast conjuries of stellar constellations, cities afar, cities afar off in the earth, cities afar off on the earth, and scenes never before beheld by eyes of this world were displayed in such a grand, sublime, and amazing extent that the soul panted with the weight of the transcendent pantherama. Pantherama. Fantherama. Fantherama. Heidi, welcome. Awesome. <laughs> welcome in. Happy Wednesday, y'all. Fantorama. Such mirrors as these, would they were mine, if kept free from promiscuous handling, treated judiciously and rightly used, are capable of more psychic marvels than all the mesmerists on the globe, exclamation point. Very few of any grade are imported, imported save when expressly ordered. The risk of breakage in crossing the seas and by inland carriage being too great, being too great to admit of larger consignments, even were it possible to have such, which it is not. Full directions for their general general use and care are given in the forepart of this book, but those of the superior grades require supplementary advertisements concerning their treatment. They should, when not in use, be kept either with face to the wall in a dark place or be covered with a broad, with a board or plate, usually furnished with them, so as to exclude every ray of light. About once a month they should be exposed to the full blaze of the sun for at least an hour, while a similar exposure, but of longer duration, to moon or starlight, invariably increases their powers and quite often adds new ones. Ooh. The larger ones may be used by a room full of persons at the same time, being fixed immovably, and the people arranging themselves so that each can see the broad, white-black river flowing continually across the surface. No one, save the owner, should either touch or sit or stand closer than from four to seven feet or more, and when the seance begins, no word should be spoken, no movement made, and it ought to open with a prayer to the most high, while special invocations for any given purpose or purposes may be made to lesser potential intelligences. Those which are now in this country are of an extraordinary character and degree of power, 
their illuminate surface has never been equaled. While their true cuspic ovoid depth and breadth is most admirable, appreciable by those favored ones who are true seers and born mystics as being immeasurably superior to any of the kind seen since the days of the Magi on the plains of Chaldea. For great pains have been taken with the glasses, which act as protecting shields to the material beneath, on which material, the mode of its preparation, seasoning, application, and magnetic manipulation, and not upon the glass itself, their beauty and excellence wholly depend, albeit the highest art is brought, in, brought to bear in the making and shaping of the crystal shield and in the construction of the frames in which they are mounted. The glyphe bata, the glyphe bata, G-L-Y-P-H-A-E, which is one letter, A-E, dash B-H-A-T-T-A-H, the glyphe bata, or mirror surface itself, is the true and well-fractured bot from India, whence alone it can be procured even by the mystic brotherhood of Paris, France, where the mounting is done. Due care is essential that they, like a child, be kept clean, to which, to which end fine soap and warm soft water applied with silk or soft flannel is the first step, followed by a similar bath, whereof cologne or liquor spurted from the mouth are the ingredients. The second for the sake, first, of the spirit, second, of the individual magnetism, and third, symbolism embodied in the ritual, so palpably as not to need further explanation. Quote, but why are these black-white cuspic ovoids magnetic or magical in any degree? Or if they are, why not, or why may, <clears throat> why may not we of Western Europe or America fabricate the same? End quote. To which the reply is, you cannot, because you know not how to mingle the materials, even if you knew them, which you do not, that enter as elements that enter as elements into the mysteriously sensitive substance wherewith the shields are covered and which alone constitutes the magnetic or magic film of which and to which the lava glass and frame are merely protective covers. <clears throat> People of the West, Europe and America, are not subject to the same extremes of passion, sexive, as the Orientals, and hence know not either its awful intensity, or its terrible penalties, because they dwell far more in the brain than in the gender. Wherefore, they have less vervalan, ver, uh, they have less vervalan and passional power than their brown brethren and sisters of the far-off eastern lands. Hmm... <laughs> um, okay, let's look up that word. Verve dash Elan. <laughs> okay. Great enthusiasm, enthusiasm and vigor. As always, Stella took the stage and performed with Verve and Elan. Verve, Elan. Okay. It's like two words. Verve, Elan, but it's one. Enthusiastic and, and assured vigor and liveliness. Verve and Elan. So, how do we say both of them? Am I, okay, Verve, I'm pretty sure on, but Elan, let's find out. Hey, you do what I want. Please? Elon. Elon. It's like my dad's name. Elon. Elon. <laughs> cool. Elon. <clears throat> Verb Elon. So where is that cool word? Here it is. They have less vervalon and passional power than their brown brethren and sisters of the far off eastern lands, 
As a general rule, with occasional exception, they are unable to reach the magnificent goals of soul vision and magic power easily attainable by the sallow devotees of saktas and saiva. It's S-A-C-H-T-H-A-S and S-A-I-V-A. Sachas, such, such thus, sak, sakthas, sakthas, and saiva, and therefore cannot real intense passional f uh, furor, furor, essentially both to the successful invocation and correspondent aerial potentialities and the charging of mirrors with the divine spiritual reflective powers which characterize them. I here allude to a profound mystery connected with their construction, known only to the initiate, but which is vaguely hinted at in the subjoined quotation, a mystery at which dolts and fools may laugh, provided they sense its nature, but which higher souls much reverence, honor, and adorn, oh, and adore. Says Colonel Stephen Fraser, 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 in his glorious volume entitled Twelve Years in India, a magnificent book, which was kindly lent me by Mr. W. G. Palgrave of Ludden, London, who called on me in August 1873 while on his overland route to China via San Francisco, and whom I had known in England 15 years before, as a polished gentleman and scholar, and one of the deepest mystics on the globe outside of the Orient. Quote, we joyfully, gladly went, five of us, her majesty's officers on a tour of military inspection the toils of which were likely to be rewarded by an opportunity of witnessing the dance of illumination of the muntra wallas or magic working brahmans whose strange miracles worked apparently by the triple agency of bata batas, batasas which is rice gukul red powder and strangest of all, by means of oval glasses or crystals, but black as night, in which it was reported, some very strange things were to be seen. We were all prepared to witness skillful jugglery for... We were all prepared to witness skillful, skillful uh, jugglery, for which the residents, excuse me, of Mutra are renowned, but fully resolved to ascertain, if possible, how it was all done, rejecting, of course, everything claimed to be either supramortal or hypernatural, so far as underlying principles were concerned. It was sheer skill, but such as no European could pretend to equal. Yet how the sleeping girl could tell our names, ages, places of birth, and fifty other true facts, she never having seen either of us before, because the dust of Jubalpur was still upon our clothes, we having been but one day in Mutra, was a problem not easily solved. They call it the sleep of Sialam, Silam, S I A L A M, and she passed into it by gazing into a dark glass. Oh shit! I missed a number forty-nine. Haven't had one of those in a long time. Forty-nine. So. That was at the beginning of the page here. Successful invocation of correspondence, aerial potentialities, and the charging of the mirrors with the divine spiritual reflective power. So potentialities 49, generally termed in the later literature of the order, the hark, the this okay, that's generally termed, okay. The hierarchies of the fraternity. Hmm. So they call it the sleep of Sialam. And she passed into it by gazing into the dark glass. Quote, After reading Lane's story about the magic mirror in his Modern Egyptians, what De Sacy says, S-A-C-Y, what De Sacy says in his famous Expedition de la Religion, Des Druses, Macrisi's account in the history of the Mamelukes, J. Catafog Cata Catafago, J. Catafago, Catafago, J. Catafago, and 
Defremini, Defremini, J. Catafago, and Def, Defremini, Defremini, in the journal Asiatique. Asiatique, what a cool word. Well, this is, I don't even know, I'm not confused. What Potter affirms as truth in his travels in Syria. Victor Langolis in Revenue de Orient, Carl Ritter, Dr. E. Smith, V. N. Hammer in his Heist des Sassines, W. H. Taylor's Knights with Oriental Magicians, and Gesta Magici, Magici, Magici of Lespanola. Letters Edifiantes, ed, edif, Edifiantes S. Curiaces. Uet's researches into magic arts and innumerable other unquestionable authorities. So that was a bunch of unquestionable authorities that I just nailed. <laughs> I just nailed that. <laughs> Oops. Um, it was far less difficult to believe in the existence of some occult visual power possessed by these mirror gazers of both sexes, all ages, and diversity of culture, than to attribute it all to chicanery and lucky guesswork. Sahib, it, Sahib, it true, said our Awala next morning, when speaking of the exhibition of the previous day, quote, and now I suppose you go see Sibieth dance, the mirror bridal fete of a renowned brotherhood of mystics, philosophers, and magicians. No doubt, question mark. Well, all, well, we all determined to go. Okay, so they're, these people are all together. Are they all together? Wow, what a crew. After reading Lane's story about the magic mirror and his modern Egyptians, what de Sacy says in his famous exposition, De la Religion de Druses, Macrisi's account in his history of the Mamelukes, J. Catafago and De Fremini in the journal Asias Asiastique, what Potter affirms as truth in his travels in Syria, Victor Langols, Lang Lang Langlois in Review d'Orient, Carl Ritter, Dr. E. Smith, V. N. Hammer in his Heis History des Sassines, W. H. Taylor's Knights with Oriental Magicians, the Gesta Magici of L'Espanola, Letters Edifiantes et Curieses, Uet's researches into magic arts and innumerable other questionable authorities, it was far less difficult to believe in the existence of some occult visual power possessed by these mirror gazers of both sexes, all ages, and diversity of culture than to attribute it all to chicanery and luck guesswork. Sieb, it true, said Arwala next morning, when speaking of the exhibition of the previous day. Okay. Sorry, I had to read that all again. I'm on the page again. And how I suppose, and now I suppose you go to see a Sibieth dance, no doubt. Well, we all determined to go. And a three hours, whoa, whoa, whoa. we all determined to go. And a three hours ride brought us to the plateau in a mountain gorge of the Chokchi, Chok, Chok, Chokey of the Chokey Hills, maybe, Chokey, C-H-O-C-H-I, of the Chokey Hills. We were not too late and were kindly offered vantage ground of view by the Sheik, a man of at least 125 years of age, judging from the fact that his grandchildren were white with snowy locks and beards waist long. The two brides entered the circle followed by the two grooms, all four bearing large earthen pots full of black, smeary, tar-like substance, which, on inquiry of the sheik, we learned was the product of the volcanic spirits of the Mahades Hills in the far-off province of Gondwana in the Deccan, Deccan, 10, that it only flows in the month of June, is collected by birds and boys who are virginal, that is, before puberty, 
and must be prepared for use within the ensuing 49 days or the ensuing 49 days. 49. By similar persons on the eve of actual marriage, as it is supposed supposed certain properties of a magical nature attached to it when handled by such persons under such circumstances. Of course, I, with my Western habits of thought and European education, could but laugh at this, which seemed so very palpable and gross a superstition. And yet strange to relate, when I expressed my special views to the old sheik, he laughed, shook his head, handed me two parts of the shell of a large nut, and requested me to fill one with the crude material, and the other with the same after it had been prepared. I did the first, and reversed the empty shell for the other, taking care to hold both of my hand, both in my hand, well wrapped up in a brown, in a brown bandana. The circle had a pile of stones in the center, upon which coals were brightly burning, and over this fire, which, by the way, is the eternal sacred fire of the Garunas, which is never allowed to go out from one year end to the other, was supposed suppose, was suspended from a tripod of betel rods and coarse earthen vessels into which the four expectant marriages poured about one fourth of the contents of the Simla gourds already mentioned. This, amid the din and the hundred tom toms or native drums the clashing of rude cymbals and wild clarion-like bursts of the strangest and shall I a strayed, a staid Briton confess it, the most soul-stirring and weird music that ever fell upon my ears or moved the man within me. After this was done, the sheik's uh, servitors erected a pole near the fire around which pole were coiled the stuffed skins of the dreadful hooded snake of India, the terrible naga or cobra, while on top was an inverted cocoa shell and two others at its base, understood by the initiated as symbolizing the linga, the male emblem or creative principle of deity, while the suspended vessel over the fire represented the yoni or female principle, the tripod, the tripod em emblem, emblematizing, emblematizing. Well, I mean, I understand what it means. I don't know how to say it. Mm, the tripod emblemat emblematizing the triple powers or qualities of Brahm, creation, preservation, perpetration, the fire below, corresponding all love, or the infinite fire, which is the life of all. And now began a strange, weird dance to the wild melody of 500 singing devotees of that wonderful phallic or sexual religion, mingled with the mellow breath of, of Scythic flutes, Scythic flutes, C-Y-T-H-I-C, Scythic flutes, and beating of tambours, the thrumming of various stringed instruments, and an occasional xyrolete or rapture shriek from the lips of women and young girls. A xyrolete is a rapture shriek from the lips of women and young girls whose enthusiasm was unrestrainable and who gave vent to it in wild movement of their graceful and supple bodies and in shrill cries that might be heard long miles away like voices from heaven awakening the echoes of space advancing with a slow voluptuous rhythmic movement not of the feet alone but of the whole from crown to toe of the whole form from crown to toe the girls aged about 15 brown as berries, agile as antelopes, graceful as gazelles, lovely, with barbaric splendor, as an Arab's ideal, huri, H-O-U-R-I, they swayed, bent, advanced by twists and curves, by nameless writhing, by sweeping genuflex, uh, genuflex, genuflexius, gen, genu, genuflexions, 
there we go, by sweeping genuflections, by movements, the very poetry of passion, but passion of soul far more than of body, with suffused faces and moistly gleaming eyes toward the taller emblem, round which they slowly twirled and danced, ever and anon stirring, with the silver spatula, the dark substance contained in the vessels they bore. It seems really cool that I just did a whole bunch of research about ecstatic dancing and spiritual dancing yesterday. This by turns, while the two youths bearing similar vessels performed corresponding movements about the vessel which symbolized nature in her productive aspect, until we five Europeans were lost in a maze of astonishment at the capacity of the human flame, of the human frame to express mutely, but with more meaning and eloquence than a thousand tongues could convey, the amazing heights, depths, and shades of passion, but a passion totally free from vulgarity or indecency, as pure as that of the ocean billows when they kiss each other over the grave of a dead cyclone. Observing my surprise, the old sheik touched my arm and in purest Bengali, in purest Bengali whispered, Sahib, Ardor, great the universe. There is no power on earth either for good or ill, but passion underlies it. That alone is the spring of all human action and the father and mother alike of all the good and evil in the earth. It is the golden key of mystery, the fountain of weakness, and of strength, and through its hold alone can man sense the ineffable essence of the Godhead. The materials in the vessels are charged with life, with the very essence of the human soul, hence with celestial and divine magic power. For, O oh, Sahib, it is only lust and hatred that keep closed the eyes of the soul. And in the crystals whose backs we cover with the contents of these five vessels, the earnest seeker may behold not only what takes place on earth, but also what transpires on other globes and in the sakwalas of the sacred gods. And this is the only true bab or door. But I rejoined, we of the West magnetize people who in that mysterious slumber tell us amazing lies, he said, interrupting the sentence. For no two of them tell the same tale or behold the same thing. Why? Because they explore the kingdoms of fancy, not of fact, and give you tales of imagination and distorted invention instead of recitals of what actually exists beyond. But wait. I acquiesced and turned once more to the dances of the Elweth, Elwewe, uh, Elwehe, A-L-E-W-E-H-E-H, -E -E Elwehe who by this time were moving in a more rapid manner to the quickened strains of the more than ever wild and fantastic music. Three of them began stirring the contents of the cauldron into which all the material from the gourds had now been poured, murmuring strange, wild bursts of phallic song the while. And the fourth, the taller maiden of the four, stripped herself entirely nude above the waist and below the knees. Her long raven hair streamed around her matchless form, a form of such superlative contour, proportions, lively peach blow tint and rounded beauty as made me blush for the imperfections of the, of the race that mothered me. There were not violent exertions of legs and arms, not the slightest effort at effect, None of the gross mutations in use in the West on the strange, on the stage or off, on the stage or off it, whose palpable object is the firing of the sluggish blood of half blazed speculators, but a graceful movement, a delicious trembling, half fear, half invitation, half a quivering, semi longing semi-reluctant undulation of arms, bosom, form, eyes even, rippling streams of most voluptuous billowy heavings and throbbings of soul through body, so wonderful, so glowing, that one wished to die immediately that he might receive the reward of centuries of toil in the ravishing arms of the Horus of the seventh, the Horus of the seventh, I, 
even the finest paradise of the Gillum and the resplendent queens of the Brahmanical Valhalla. And yet there was absolutely nothing suggestive, of course, gross, animal passion in all this transcendental melody of hypersensuous motion. On the contrary, one felt like seizing her by the waist, drawing his sword and challenging all earth and hell to boot to take her away or disturb her tranquility of celestial, what shall I call it? I am lost for a name. Presently, both the girls joined the mystic sensuous magic dance and one of them seized me suddenly by the arm and dragged me to the central vessel saying, look, Sahib, look. I did so, but instead of a black mass of seething boiling gum, I beheld a cauldron bubbling over with the most gorgeously pink-tinted froth that imagination ever dreamed of. And while I stood there marveling at the singular phenomenon, for every bubble took the form of a flower, lotus, aramanth, violet, lily, rose, the old sheik drew nigh and said, Sahib, now's the time, pointing to the bundle containing the empty shell and the one already half filled. Acting on the suggestion, I held forth the empty shell, into which the girl ladled about a gill of the contents of the, of the swinging vessel, and the sheik produced two perfectly clean ovoid glass plates, over which he poured respectively the contents of the two shells, and held both over the fire for a minute, till dry, and then ha handed, handing them to me, said, Look, and wish, and will, to see whatever is nearest and dearest to your heart. Internally I laughed, but he took the two shells, and while he held them, I looked into the hollow face of the glass, which was covered with the singular substance first handed to me, and glazing and gazed and gazing steadily about half a minute, the mystic dance going on meanwhile, I willed to see my home and people in far off Albion. Nothing appeared. The old man smiled. Now look at the other one, which is a true batea, full of divine light and imperial power, and you will. Before he finished, I glanced into the other, and scarce hoping that the Western reader will credit me with anything loftier than a vivid imagination, fired almost beyond endurance by the lascivious surroundings in the midst of which I was, I nevertheless clearly and distinctly affirm on the hitherto unsullied honor of an English gentleman and a colonel in Her Majesty's service that I saw a wave of pale white light flit like a cloud shadow over the face of the mysterious disk, and in the center of that light a landscape composed of trees, houses, lands, lowing cattle, and forms of human beings, each and every item of which I recognized as the old familiar things of my boyhood and youth, long ere the fires of ambition and, and tuned my face toward distant India. I beheld the simac sim simul simulacrum the simulacrum of a dear sister. I beheld the simulacrum of a dear sister whom I had left in perfect health. I saw her to all appearance very, very sick. The physicians, nurses, troops of friends, and faithful servitors gathered around her. She was dying, dead. I saw the funeral cordage set. I saw the funeral cordage set. Oh, we just looked that one up. Balls set out, oh, it's like a procession, right? Okay, yeah. Cordage set out for the cemetery, and I marveled greatly that they buried her by the iron ribs of a railway, because when I left, no road of that kind ran through my native town. I saw the silver plate on her coffin, and most clearly and distinctly read the inscription therein, but the surname was one I had never heard of. I looked up at the sheik, who was eyeing me with strange interest and intensity, as if to ask an explanation. But he only smiled and repeated the one word, C, with exclamation point. Instantly, I turned my eyes to the ovoid again, as likewise did three of my European friends, and to my and their utter astonishment beheld a shadow, an exact image of myself, standing near the well curb of my native manse, 
weeping as if its heart would break. Over the prostrate, prostrate form of my elder brother, who lain there dying from a rifle bullet through the groin, the result of an accident that had just befallen him while in the act of drinking from the swinging pail or bucket. Now came the most astonishing phenomena of all, for each of the three friends who were looking with me stared in surprise and uttered exclamations of undisguised astonishment, for each had seen things beyond the range or pale of trickery or the play of excited fancy. One beheld the three forms of his dead father, sister, and uncle, the latter pointing to a sealed packet on which was inscribed the word Dead Will, Air, October 18th, Go Home. The other beheld the drawing, Room, and its occupants of the old house at home. And on the table lay a large pile of gold coin across which lay a legend thus, Gem and David's Winnings, Lottery, Paris, June 18th, 10,000 pounds. The third man saw a battle or skirmish waging in the Punjab, and his senior officer struck down by a shot in the side, thus opening the road to his own promotion. Much more we saw and noted in that wonderful scene of diablerie, portions of which I shall detail at length hereafter, but I became but it became necessary to attend to other matter, matters. I did so, as will be hereinafter cited, and then accompanied the sheik to his tent, where the marriage was celebrated, and he told me there, and he told me there certain wonderful secrets in reference to the further preparation of the strange material composing the reflective surfaces of the curious bots, which, while exceedingly mystic and effective, at the hands of offices of the newly married people, is yet of so singular and delicate a nature as not to be admissible to these pages. For while really of the most holy and sacred nature, yet the miseducation in certain vital respects and knowledges of the civilized Teutonic, <clears throat> Anglo-Saxon, and Latin races would render the matters to which I allude subjects of either not well-based blushes or outright mirth. Seven long months after these memorable experiences, I parted with three of my then comrades and accompanied by two others embarked on one of the, one of the steamers of the mess, messageries, messageries imperial, imperialis, messengeries imperialis from Bombay, homeward bound. Before I left, one of my friends had sold his commission in consequence of having fallen heir to an uncle's estate, who the letters of recall stated had died in England on October 10th, and not on the 11th, as the ovoid had stated. It had actually taken the difference of longitude, and was correct to an hour. <laughs> The second man, on arrival in England, proved the truth of the mirror. For Fane, not Jem, as the glass stated, and Davidson, not David, cousins of his had fallen on a lottery fortune of over a lakh of rupees in India money. The other officers was the other officer was promoted in consequence of the death of his lieutenant, Colonel, in a skirmish in the Punjab which event was the result of a shot in the loins, not the side. Arrived at home, I found my people in deep mourning for my younger sister, the widow, after a wifehood of less than a year, of Captain H. Blank, of Her Majesty's wife, wifehood, no, of Her Majesty's Navy, whom she had met for the first time only a few months before their marriage. I had left for India five years before, and though I had often heard of my brother-in-law's family, yet we had never met. Let me get a sip here. Angel, welcome in. And well, uh, Trace, welcome in. Welcome all. We're getting close. but we had never met. He went down in one of the new crank 
ironclads, ironclads on her trial trip. The awful news occasioned premature motherhood. She died, and her remains were deposited in the hillside vault, skirting which was a railway just equipped and opened for traffic a month or two prior to the marine disaster. Lastly, within eight months after my return, I became sole male heir to our family property in consequence of the death of my brother by a choice by, by a charge of shot. Not a bullet in the groin, as the mirror showed, but full in the abdomen, while climbing a fence for a drink at the brookside, and not at a well. Every fact shown so mysteriously as proved strangely true, though not literally so. I, just previous to my departure from the strange bridal, asked the old sheik some questions, and learned that the material on the crystal surface wherein we saw the strange miracles was but partially prepared, as my readers will also recollect, but some which he placed on a glass just before I left, and which had been fully prepared, the finishing process being a secret one, and conducted by the newly wedded couples, by the a peculiar process and nameless, never made a mistake while in my possession. I confess I lost it from a silly servant having shown it boastingly to a gypsy who stole it that same night through the most adroit, through the most adroit bit of scientific burglary I ever heard or read of. Adroit. Let's look it up. Wow, that sucks. Clever or skillful in using the hands or mind. Adroit. 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 All right. Cool. Clever or skillful in using the hands or mind. Hmm. I'm at the end of this, I think. Adroit. Where's that word? Burglary. Adroit. The most adroit bit of scientific burglary I ever heard or read of. The loss, however, was not irreparable, for I have since found that these strange muntra wallas, as they are contemptuously called by their Islamic foes in the Carnatic, but true magi in the opinion of better informed people, have brethren and correspondents in nearly every country on the globe. Brazil, China, Japan, Vienna, and even our own London, while they have a regular lodge in Paris, of some of whom the initiated, the favored, ignorance even, can and do obtain occasionally. Not only well-charged and polished batea, batea, but actually now and then a gourd full of mulev bata, mulev bata, the strangely mysterious substance which constitutes the seeing surface, as mercury does in the ordinary looking glass, the two are alike in all save that the latter reflects matter and the living, while the former, sometimes not all, not at all times, or to all people, or to the successful seers in all occasions, reveals only spirit and the dead, I and the things, and things that never die. I and things that never die. Hmm. Heaven help all whom a mantra walla hates. For the magician in one case will bring up the hatred one's shadow, the hated one's shadow. And then strange horrors will seize him or her. And in the later case, well, stranger things happen. That is all. <clears throat> so, where's an asterisk? Exactly the reason why I have been unable to find a single true adept or adept in the USA. PBR. Thus much by way of information, those who have read the works of Munt, Hardgrave, Jennings, Lawry, Palgrave, Morier, Lane, need not be told that these bots have been initiated often, but without avail, for unless they be true. 
not a cloud even can be seen. There is another secret about them which can only be revealed to such as to such as have and use them. And not then till they shall have proved worthy of the knowing. And not then till they shall have proved worthy of the knowing. So without a veil to 50, the process of manufacture might be the same, but where is the spiritualized and potentialized material? Potentized, potentized material to be found, which is necessary to give and hold continual life in the survivor, question mark. In the performance of the necessary rites, the Western mind would see only means for self-satisfaction and be forgetful of the high office of the process or acts. Now I wish right here to say that some persons have been disappointed in such because all mysteries of the heaven or gold in the ground or hidden money, etc., were not at once revealed. I never used one for any such purpose, but sat and gazed upon it, awaiting patiently for aught that was vouchsafed in the way of visions or phantoramas. This is their negative and immeasurable lowest use. The highest is to sit gazing until the gazer shall pass into a trans transcendently lofty and most interior state, absolute, unequivocal, supra-clairvoyant condition, and then, ah, then, as myriad glories unfold and roll before the soul's eyes, the seer is every inch a king or queen, and can laugh his life and world, and all their trials, troubles, and infinite littleness to utter scorn, and as it were, snap his fingers at life, death, and their copula, copula, circumstance. And this is the positive use of a good batea, batia. <laughs> the facts of psychovision, mesmeric lucidity, somnambulic sight, and clairvoyance, so called, are too numerable, palpable, and well authenticated in this age to be questioned. The old time the old time animal magnetism and its marvels gave way to what was called electrical psychology, which in turn receded before the advance of what were called seeing mediums, but few of whom, however, could see the same facts alike, and all gave way before the better method of developing the inner vision. By a royal road, the goal is reached in these days, and that too without delays. The uh, without delays, dangers, and uncertainties heretofore attending all methods of attaining that strange soul sight where wherewith not a few have astonished the world. But a higher, broader, deeper clairvoyance is now needed and demanded by mankind, far superior to that displayed by the riffraff pluggings of half-crazed fanatics, the money-grabbing hordes of fortune-tellers, infesting all large cities, the biologists, psychologists, and others of the same order and genera. The new has become old and the old new, and a better method of self-development is found in the revived practice than in all the others singly or combined. In India, China, Japan, Siam, Upper Egypt, Arabia, Central Nagritia, Nagritia, Nagritia? I don't know. And on the far off plains of Tartary and Tibet, the old usage still survives, and the seers divine through shells and crystals and diamonds, emeralds, or the plain and less expensive and less expensive dark ovoid, wholly surpassing the boasted clairvoyance of France, England, and America, and in the same identical lines too, albeit some uses thereof are perversions from their true and normal, whether for, more, for mere financial ends, as by the raising and falling of the white or yellow cloud, or spot on the mirror surface, indicative of similar movements in the correspondence precious metals, the floating or the sinking of a fleece or stocks, the rising or lowering of a stock or sheaf of wheat, a sheaf of wheat. Declarative of the course to be taken by that cereal in the markets of the world for 
sometimes weeks ahead, or whether the object's purposes and ends sought pertain to the higher, broader, or deeper ranges of human thought and speculation. Unquestionably, this ancient mode of dealing with the dead and reporting the mystical worlds above, beneath, within, and around us is, a superior, is as superior to modern circleism as gold in beauty in beauty outvies well, as gold in beauty outvies rough iron. Hence, students and explorers of the mystical side of the human soul, those desirous of opening the sealed doors of strange new worlds and realizing somewhat of the tremendous problem of being, must develop not merely progress. And to such, the process of self self culturement is by me considered absolutely indispensable and worth more to an anxious, earnest, light-seeking, yet not impatient soul than all the circles and magnetists on the four continents, because the developed man or woman grows character. The progressed becomes an absolute power on the globe. Oh, no, wait, no. The progressed ones merely memory and tact. I skipped a line. And to be an independent seer is to become an absolute power in the globe, on the globe. Whereas all forms of atomacy, magnetic or otherwise, are but forms of serfdom and slavery and powers incapable of identification and for that reason, doubly dangerous. But the question arises with many, can any and everyone successfully use the bots? The reply is no, yes, not everyone can see them, but everyone can develop by them the eight characteristics of perfect man and womanhood, will, attention, concentration, persistence, self-restraint, reliance, magnetic energy, and affection. By an hour's steady use per day and thus develop soul, thereby growing the power of death survival and enduring immortality. For I hold that those who cannot see in them at all, or produce clouds, or other magnetic effects after fair trial, may rest assured that they lack the great essential to immortality. And unless they cultivate soul, and starve for it, then death lands their bodies in the grave, their inner selves will dwindle back to the monodal state, monodal state of blank nility. Nihility, nility, balls. I gotta look up those two words. M O N A D A L. Monodal, monodal. M O N A D A L. M O N A D A L. Being or relating to a monad. Oh, monadal. Oh, monad. 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 Monadal. Monadal. <laughs> Logic mathematics of an operator predicate having only a single argument place. Monadal. Okay. Dwindle back to the mon monadal state of blank nullity. Nihilism, N nihility, oh, I should probably start with an N, nihility, 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 non-existence, nothingness, okay, yeah, annihilation, nihility, annihilation, Okay, nihility. The monada, monadal state of blank n n nihility. Nihility. Others can see in them, if not at once, then in periods varying from six weeks to one year. And the slower the development, the grander will be the power when culture shall have brought it into play. I have known a few utter failures with them. But the successes outnumber them 
at least in the ration, of 500 to 1. When used by a single one, the front may be gazed at, but a glorious surface is presented edgewise or obliquely. In Lodge, the company, whether it be few or many persons, should sit in a semicircle, the mirror leaning against the wall, and the glare of it bullseye lantern, and the glare of a bullseye lantern be thrown full and round upon its glowing face, yet all be still and motionless, and then carefully note the result. To conclude, I so not approve of the use of them for purposes of magnetizing the opposite sexes. Affectionately, for although easily done, yet I think love thus gained is not apt to be enduring, by reason of its too ardent and too often passional character, hence cannot fully satisfy the needs of the human soul. Yet I do believe it good to stir the medicine for the sick with the finger in the basin of the ovoid, for by such means it can be quadruply charged with the divinest and most loving, therefore healing effluency, effluence, effluence of the tremendous soul of man, Concluding paragraphs through the night. Oh, wait, where's the 51? There's something that I'm missed the number. Maybe I haven't gotten to it. No. Balls. I really, I'm really not seeing this number. I don't know what it links back to. Maybe when we read it, we'll be able to tell. Many will suspect from our true name, Brotherhood, of Euless, that we really mean El Eleusis, Eleusis, E-L-E-U-S-I-S, -E and they are not far from wrong. The Illusion philosophers, with whom Jesus is reported to have studied, were philosophers of sex, and the Illusion mysteries were mysteries thereof, just such as the writer of of this has taught ever since he began to think and suffered for his thoughts through the unfledging philosopher of the century amidst whom only now and then can a true thinker or real reasoner be found. Reasoner. I like that. I love yous. Oh, have a good nap. I love yous. Through the night, of the time the lamp of Euless has lighted our path and enabled. Oh, it's, oh, you know why I couldn't find it? It's, it's right at the beginning of this concluding paragraph. So I did it, I did it right in perfect timing. Great. Through the night of time, the lamp of Euless has lighted our path and enabled obscure brethren to illuminate the world. But before Pythagoras, Plato, Hermes, and Buddha, we were, and when their systems shall topple into dust, we will still flourish in immortal youth because we drink of life at its holy fountain. Restored, pure, healthful, and normal sex with its uses and to with us means restoration, strength, ascension, not their baleful opposites, as in the world outside the pale of genuine science. Up to the publications thereof or hereof, on this continent, we were indeed secret, for not one-tenth of those tested and called Roshacrucians knew of the deeper yet simpler philosophy. But the time has come to spread the new doctrine because the age is ripe. I, we, no longer put up different barriers or difficult barriers, but affiliate with all who are broad enough to accept truth, no matter what garb she may wear. But till then, we shut out the world. Now the infinite, all seekers after the attainable. We have determined to teach the esoteric doctrines of the eighth, A-E-T-H, 52, the philosophy, doctrines, and practices taught by the eighth priesthood, the third and highest order of the secret schools. To accept all worthy aspirants, initiate them, and empower them to indestruct oh no, that is not what it says and upbuild and initiate others forming lodges if they so please the end boom dang we did it
Wow. And just like everything, perfect timing. This is so cool. Wow, we finished another book, you guys. <laughs> this is great. Okay, well, I'm about to pee my pants. I've had to go for a while. I got to get myself to the bathroom. <laughs> but before I do so, I just want to thank you and um, wish you wonderful Wednesdays. And man, new moon, new cycle. I like that. I'm going to start seeing, you know, some growing light again. So enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm sure I'll be back sooner than later. So thank you. Mwah. I see you soon. Boom shakalaka pop. <laughs> I love that. Lighters, I love you.